Good morning. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Ambassador Park, and uh, for hosting us here at the J Institute uh, for Advanced uh, Studies. It's, uh, it's a great honor to be here uh, together with you this morning. It is also great to be back in Seoul uh, and engage with uh, all of you. My last visit to the Republic of Korea was in 2017. And since then, uh, your country's partnership uh, with NATO has uh, grown even stronger. For years, we have cooperated uh, on issues ranging from counter-terrorism uh, to counter-piracy. And going forward, uh, we can do more together, uh, NATO and um, the Republic of Korea, including to strengthen um, our efforts uh, on global arms control, address um, disarmament and uh, non-proliferation, work on new uh, technologies, uh, enhance our cyber defenses, and uphold the rules-based international order. I welcome the fact that um, South Korea established a dedicated diplomatic mission to NATO last uh, November. And last June, I was honored to welcome President Yoon uh, to our NATO summit in Madrid. It was the first time ever uh, uh, he and the other leaders from the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, partners of NATO, Australia, Japan uh, and New Zealand participated together in the NATO summit. A real testimony uh, to our growing ties. We may be oceans apart, uh, but our security is, is closely connected. This has been the case for decades. Events in this region have shaped NATO as we know it today. The Korean War broke out just one year after the alliance was founded in 1949. It made uh, our members realize the need to bolster our defensive power. As a result of the Korean War, we transformed the North Atlantic Treaty into the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, literally putting an O uh, to, into NATO. This involved uh, creating the position of the Secretary General, standing up a permanent military uh, headquarters, and appointing uh, a Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. So NATO's history and uh, our security has long been uh, connected uh, with yours. And today we continue to share strategic interests and concerns. The threat posed by North Korea is one of them. North Korea constitutes, um, uh, continues its pattern of provocative and destabilizing behavior, including unprecedented missile tests over the past year, as well as uh, continued nuclear activity and rhetoric, all in contravention of UN Security Council resolutions. This poses a clear and present danger to the Republic of Korea, to the wider region, and to international peace and security. We stand with our partners in calling on Pyongyang uh, to stop its provocations and comply fully with international law. North Korea has also delivered rockets and missiles to the Russian Wagner Group, further fueling Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. President Putin launched uh, his war almost one year ago to take control of the country and take away people's freedom. In response, NATO and NATO allies and our partners around the world, including South Korea, have condemned this illegal and unjustifiable war. And we have been providing Ukraine unprecedented assistance. Our support is making a real difference for the Ukrainians helping them not only to survive, but also to push back uh, the Russian invader and uh, liberate their territory. We must keep supporting Ukraine for as long as it takes. Because if President Putin wins, the message to him and other authoritarian leaders will be that they can get what they want through the use of force. This would make the world 
more dangerous and us more vulnerable. So what happens in Europe matters to the Indo-Pacific. And what happens here in Asia matters to NATO. Our security is connected, so we must remain united and firm. Insist on full respect for the UN Charter and ensure oppression and tyranny do not prevail over freedom and democracy. You can count on NATO to stand with the Republic of Korea and other like-minded partners to promote peace, protect our shared security, and preserve a global system based on norms and values. Thank you, and then I'm ready to engage in a conversation with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General. We will now proceed to the Q&A session. This session will be moderated by Professor Jae Sung Lee, Jang Monet Chair in College of International Studies and former Dean of Graduate School of International Studies at Korea University. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary General, Secretary General Stoltenberg. It was a wonderful speech to, to address our common challenges and uh, the key tasks for the future. And once again, uh, thanks for visiting Che Institute and this event co-organized by KU Changmone Center. Now I will uh, begin the Q&A session, the conversation with the Secretary General. And today, uh, many students and experts kindly attend this event to facilitate uh, the Q&A session, I have received a good number of questions in advance via online. So I will start with those questions and then I will open the floor for more inquiries. The biggest inquiry from the Korean side, but probably from all of the world it is when will the Russo-Ukrainian war end? But let me put it this way. Under which condition this war can be ended? And is there a, a chance for ceasefire or peace agreement this year? No one can tell uh, today when the war uh, uh, will end. But what we do know is that this is a war of aggression. Uh, this is actually a war of choice by President Putin. Uh, he decided to invade another country, a sovereign uh, democratic uh, state in uh, Europe. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, President Putin can end the war today. Um, but we know, uh, or, but the, the challenge is that we don't see any uh, signs that uh, President Putin and the uh, rulers in Moscow uh, are preparing for peace. We see the opposite. We see that they are preparing for more war, that they are mobilizing more soldiers, more than 200,000, and uh, potentially even more than that, that they are actively, actively um, uh, 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 acquiring new uh, weapons, more ammunition, uh, ramping up their own production, but also acquiring uh, more weapons from other authoritarian states like uh, uh, Iran and North Korea. Uh, and uh, most of all, we have seen no sign that uh, President Putin has changed his overall uh, goal uh, of this invasion, that is to control uh, 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 a neighbor, you can control uh, Ukraine. So as long as this is the case, we need to be prepared for long haul. Uh, because um, uh, everyone who believes in democracy, in, uh, in, uh, in a rules-based international order, uh, for us, it is extremely important uh, that President Putin doesn't win this war, uh, partly because it will be a tragedy for the Ukrainians, but it will also be dangerous uh, for all of us. It will make the world more dangerous, uh, because then the message to uh, authoritarian leaders um, also in this part of the world, also in, in Beijing, will be uh, that uh, uh, use of force is the way uh, to get what you want. Uh, and that uh, will make the world more dangerous and us more vulnerable. So therefore, it is so important that we continue to support Ukraine. I welcome uh, the support from, uh, from uh, NATO allies, uh, from partners, and also from, from the Republic of uh, Korea. Uh, and, uh, and we need to be uh, prepared. Um, let me add one more thing on this, and that is that 
not all wars, but many wars uh, end at the negotiating table. Uh, and uh, most likely also this war uh, will uh, at some stage end uh, uh, at the negotiating table. Uh, uh, but what we do know is that what happens around uh, that table is inextricably linked to and totally dependent on uh, the situation on the battlefield. Uh, so, so if we really want uh, Ukraine to prevail as a sovereign independent nation in Europe, then we need to support them uh, now. Uh, military support today makes it uh, possible uh, to reach a, a peace agreement uh, tomorrow. But as long as President Putin believes that he can win on the battlefield, he will not sit down and engage in good uh, faith. So the paradox is that actually the military support to Ukraine is the uh, best way to achieve a peaceful negotiated uh, solution uh, in, uh, in the war or for the war. So even though we may not predict the exact date of, of ending the war, but we have a clear way to go to to support Ukraine and to end the war. Okay, uh, our next question is about the new Cold War. We are witnessing the crisis of post-Cold War peace structure in Europe. At the same time, US-China competition is getting escalated. The, Taiwan's, the tension in the Taiwan Strait is growing. So do you agree with the term new Cold War? to describe the current global geopolitics? So I don't use that term um, uh, for many reasons. Um, um, partly because during the Cold War we had two uh, blocks confronting each other. Uh, and uh, in Europe there was uh, uh, the Warsaw Pact and, uh, and NATO. Uh, and, uh, and we had hundreds of thousands of uh, troops standing uh, on each side of, uh, of that uh, Iron Curtain over or the, the border between East and, uh, and West. We had also two uh, kind of political uh, uh, ideologies uh, in the West and, uh, and then the Soviet Union, uh, kind of communist um, part of, uh, of, uh, of Europe. Um, uh, now, we have, uh, now we have a full-fledged war. Also, we have a full-fledged war going on in Europe and we have different types of, 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 of confrontation. Uh, also because what we see now is um, is also how uh, how um, uh, Russia and China are coming uh, closer and closer. We don't regard China as an adversary, but of course we are concerned when we see that uh, Russia and China are operating more together. Uh, they are training more together, patrolling together. We see uh, naval patrols, air patrols, also uh, uh, in uh, around Taiwan, in uh, in 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 the Asia Pacific. Uh, we also, uh, just days before uh, the invasion of Ukraine, uh, President Putin went uh, to Beijing and signed an agreement uh, where uh, President Xi and President Putin promised each other uh, uh, cooperation and partnership without any limits, a limitless partnership. Uh, so, so, uh, so from different reasons, I don't use the word a, call, a cold war, uh, but the challenge is that we are not we are not in what we hoped for after the end of the Cold War, because after the end of the Cold War, we hoped for a world where we actually uh, saw democracy, the rule of law, um, spreading, uh, uh, first of all, throughout Europe, but then also more and more uh, globally. Uh, what we see now is that uh, democracy, freedom is under pressure, and we see autocracy and tyranny is actually uh, uh, pushing and, uh, and trying to get more control also of uh, other countries, uh, as we have seen, for instance, in Ukraine. Right, so uh, let's move to the China issue. Well, how does NATO perceive China as a threat? Is there a specific strategy of NATO to deal with the rise of Chinese military capability in recent years? I think we have to understand that um, from decades, uh, China was not on NATO's agenda at all. Uh, NATO was established as a response to the threats we saw from the Warsaw Pact, uh, the Soviet Union, after the Second World War. Uh, and, uh, and that was our 
main, that was the main focus. That was what NATO did for, for 40 years, from 1949 to 1989, when the Berlin Wall uh, came down. After that, uh, 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 of course, we were less focused on the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact was dissolved. But then uh, we helped to end ethnic wars in, the, in, uh, in Europe, in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina and, uh, and Kosovo, Serbia. And after 9-11, uh, we were very focused on, <coughs> on the fight against terrorism. Um, it is, has only been recently that NATO has started also to address the challenges we see uh, uh, coming from uh, China. Uh, and um, until our summit uh, 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 last summer in Madrid in July uh, last year, uh, China was not mentioned with a single word in NATO's strategic concept. And NATO's strategic concept is our main uh, document guiding uh, the alliance. Um, <coughs> um, so now we have, uh, uh, now we are addressing uh, China in our strategic concept, but, but that happened actually as late as last uh, summer. Um, uh, we don't regard, um, so we have come a long way when it comes to, to, uh, to China. We don't regard China as an adversary. Um, uh, we, we believe that we uh, should uh, engage with China on, on issues like arms control, uh, climate change and other uh, 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 issues. Uh, but at the same time, we are very clear that uh, China poses uh, a challenge uh, to our values, uh, to our interests and to our security. And there are many reasons for that, uh, partly because China doesn't share our values. Uh, China and the rulers in Beijing, they don't believe in democracy, freedom of speech, uh, our democratic uh, 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 values. Uh, we have seen that uh, in the way they are cracking down on democratic uh, rights uh, in Hong Kong, how they uh, uh, oppress minorities in their own uh, country. Um, uh, but China is also uh, a challenge because we see that China is investing heavily in new modern military capabilities, including long-range missiles that can reach uh, all NATO territory, of course, also this region, uh, um, um, advanced nuclear weapons, uh, naval capabilities, uh, and, um, and NATO as an alliance will remain an alliance of North America and Europe. But North America and Europe, uh, the threats and the challenges we face, they are more and more global. That has been the case for many years. So we, we, uh, terrorism is a global threat. Uh, cyber is a global threat. Space is more and more relevant for our security. Uh, and of course then China, uh, with its rising capabilities, its coercive behavior, not least in the South China uh, Sea, and, and, uh, and lack of respect for the values we believe in, is uh, an increasing challenge uh, to our values, to our security, uh, to our uh, interests. And that makes the partnership with uh, countries like the Republic of Korea, uh, uh, countries that believe in democracy, uh, even more important uh, because our security is interconnected. The closer partnership between Russia and China uh, demonstrates that. Uh, 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 the fact that uh, Russia is also reaching out to North Korea to get support for the war in uh, Ukraine is another example. Uh, so now China uh, is much higher on the NATO agenda, uh, also for one other reason, and that is that um, China is in many ways coming closer to NATO. Uh, we see them in cyberspace. Uh, we see what they are uh, developing when it comes to space capabilities, which satellites, everything which are vital for communications uh, on Earth. Um, uh, and, and then also uh, China trying to control uh, critical infrastructure, uh, for instance, 5G networks. So all of this together, uh, uh, the, the, the lack of shared values, uh, the, the coercive behavior in, uh, in the South China Sea and, is, and in this uh, region, uh, the uh, significant uh, military buildup with long-range uh, weapons, and uh, the fact that China is uh, working more and more closely with, uh, with uh, Russia, for instance, not being able to condemn the invasion of Ukraine, all of this together, has made China uh, something that uh, features much higher on the NATO agenda and matters for our security in a way it didn't uh, do before. Sir Tony, uh, in Korea, uh, there are concerns that strengthening partnership with NATO will lead to conflict with China. 
and China's possible economic coercion and retaliation. What's your opinion on this matter? Well, again, as we don't regard China as an adversary, and NATO allies are trading with uh, with China, and no one is arguing in favor of uh, not having economic relationships with uh, China. Uh, but at the same time, I think also we need to realize that uh, if we become too dependent on authoritarian powers, uh, we make ourselves vulnerable. Uh, and again, for me, I can use an example from uh, from Europe. Not so long time ago, many European countries said that to buy natural gas from uh, Russia was uh, purely a commercial issue. Um, so it was, if it was commercial, we should do it. If we can uh, make profit, we should do it. Uh, what we have learned is that, or what we have seen is that, uh, uh, to be dependent on energy from an authoritarian power like Russia is a political issue, uh, because uh, Russia decided to weaponize uh, uh, energy exports, uh, which has led to extreme high prices and, and an energy crisis in uh, in uh, in Europe. So no, now no one says that to buy gas from uh, Russia is a commercial issue. We should only we should do it as long as it is uh, profitable. We can earn uh, money. Um, Everyone understands that commercial decisions, they may have huge security uh, uh, consequences. So therefore we need to take them into account. That doesn't mean we should have no trade with authoritarian regimes, but, it, but, but we should not make the same mistake as I, I mean all of us, uh, the Republic of Korea, Europe, uh, North America. Uh, um, we should not make the same mistake uh, that many allies have made when it comes to energy dependency from uh, Russia, we should not make the same mistake uh, when it comes to China, meaning to be too dependent on specific commodities, uh, specific raw materials, rare earth minerals, for instance, um, um, make us vulnerable. Um, uh, uh, um, if we start to export uh, advanced technologies that uh, uh, China or Russia later on can use uh, to threaten us, then we make ourselves vulnerable. And, uh, and, uh, and finally, if we allow uh, China to control critical infrastructure, we become vulnerable. So this is a balance, and it's not easy to say exactly where that balan balance goes, but to, but to just think as we can have free trade uh, 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 economic relations as if this has no uh, consequences of security, that is wrong. Uh, I'm in favor of free trade. I believe in free trade uh, to, uh, uh, as a way to promote prosperity. Uh, but, uh, but free trade cannot be more important than freedom. And, uh, and uh, free trade cannot uh, uh, be more important than our security. And for me, the example of uh, 5G uh, uh, um, in, uh, or uh, gas dependence on, uh, from, uh, from, from Russia are two quite... Uh, telling examples of how we have to also take to take uh, security interest in, into concern uh, when we make economic decisions. <coughs> okay, um, now let's move uh, a bit closer to the Korean side. Uh, well, you have mentioned the importance of supporting uh, the Ukrainian military capability to, to fight against Russia. Then uh, what Role, which role can South Korean weaponry in helping arm Ukraine in their war against Russia? Well, do you have any uh, specific expectation? So first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, the Republic of Korea or South Korea for uh, the support uh, uh, you uh, are providing to uh, Ukraine, economic support, humanitarian support. Uh, uh, that is something which is highly valued. Um, uh, and of course, that com comes uh, uh, on top of uh, the support that uh, uh <coughs> NATO allies and partners are providing, uh, both military and economic uh, support. Uh, and, and I urge uh, uh, the Republic of Korea to uh, continue and to step up on, on the specific issue of military support. I would say that's, at the end of the day, a, a decision for you to make. Uh, but I will say that several NATO allies who had as a policy never to export uh, uh, weapons to, uh, to countries in conflict have changed that policy now. That, that also, uh, Germany, um, uh, 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 
Sweden, which is not a NATO ally, but a close NATO part of my own country, Norway, uh, we had as a, as a, as a, uh, as a stated uh, uh, long-standing policy, uh, as many other NATO allies, not to export weapons uh, from uh, Norway or from Germany or from, from, from Sweden and other NATO allies to countries in conflict. After brutal uh, invasion of Ukraine, uh, these countries changed their policy because they realized that when you are faced with a brutal invasion where a big power, Russia, invades another one in a blatant way, as we have seen in, uh, in uh, Ukraine, uh, if, we really believe, if we believe in freedom, if we believe in, in, uh, in democracy, if we don't want uh, autocracy and, uh, and uh, tyranny to, to, to win, then they need weapons. So that, that, that's, the, that, that's the reality. Uh, because we, we tried before the invasion, NATO uh, tried um, uh, by diplomatic means, by political means, uh, to really prevent this inv in invasion, uh, prevent the, the war. Uh, because, as you may remember, uh, this war didn't come as a surprise. Uh, this is a war that happened uh, uh, after we have warned against it for months. The, in, the invasion by Russia of, uh, of Ukraine is part of a pattern. We have seen the brutality in, in Bosnia, we have seen the invasion of Georgia in 2008, we have seen the bombing of Aleppo, and then the war in Ukraine didn't start in February last year, it started actually in 2014. So it's part of a pattern. But when the full-fledged invasion happened February last year, uh, then many countries changed their policy because they realized that the only way to stand up for democracy, to help uh, uh, Ukraine prevail, and to create the conditions for uh, a lasting peace, was to deliver military support. Uh, so, uh, again, I will be uh, careful giving too much specific advice, uh, 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 but I would just say that uh, there is an urgent need for more ammunition, more weapons to Ukraine. If they don't get that, they will not be able to resist and repel the, the, the Russian uh, uh, invasion, in, invaders and the Russian uh, aggression. Well, uh, the NATO was originally established to cover the security in the North, Northern Atlantic region. Then, what makes the partnership with NATO attractive to South Korea? And the related question I receive is that if a security contingency happens in the Korean Peninsula, what kind of response we can expect from the NATO side? What do the NATO can do for the peace building on the Korean Peninsula in times of contingency? So, you are right that we were established uh, to address uh, the threat from the Soviet Union in the 50s and the 60s, uh, or what we saw just after the end of the, uh, the Second World War. Um, but as I said, the, the world has fundamentally changed since then. So we face uh, common threats and challenges. One area where I welcome that we see cooperation between um, the Republic of Korea and NATO is, for instance, cyber. And we face threats and challenges in cyberspace where we can uh, learn from each other, we can uh, share best practices. Um, and uh, 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 the Republic of Korea is, is, is part of our uh, center of excellence on cybersecurity in Tallinn as a NATO center and also participates uh, in, in, in our uh, cyber coalition exercise, which is the world's biggest uh, exercise on, uh, on cyber security and cyber defense. So that's just one example of how we can uh, work together uh, for mutual benefit for, for Korea and for uh, NATO. Uh, uh, technology is another, uh, disarmament, arms control is a third area where uh, there is uh, absolute potential for doing more uh, together. Uh, I think I will be very careful about speculating about hypothetical situations, but the message to to uh, uh, Pyongyang and North Korea is that uh, their threatening rhetoric, but also uh, the reckless uh, program they have when it comes to missile uh, programs and nuclear programs is dangerous. It's dangerous uh, for, for uh, uh, the Republic of Korea, it's dangerous for the region, and it's also a threat to 
international peace and security. And therefore, NATO allies have, uh, f first and foremost, of course, been very strong uh, on uh, calling on uh, North Korea to uh, follow and abide by all these uh, uh, UN Security Council resolutions, uh, impose the sanctions on North Korea, uh, and then uh, and then I think uh, I should be careful speculating about exactly what will happen if we have an uh, incident uh, in this region. Thank you. Uh, in the Madrid NATO summit last year, uh, the gathering of NATO plus Asia Pacific four countries, Korea, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand, received lots of attention, as you, and as you have mentioned in, in your remark. And is there a possibility to institutionalize this partnership? And what does NATO expect the Asian partners to work with in this framework? NATO plus AP. So first of all, we have in one way already made this uh, kind of uh, formal framework uh, because uh, we have uh, uh, um, a partnership agreements with uh, the Republic of Korea, with Japan. I'm going there uh, actually tonight. Uh, uh, with Australia and uh, with uh, New Zealand. Uh, and uh, we also then often meet uh, in that framework at NATO. But for me, it's also important to uh, to communicate that, uh, of course, the, the partnership with all four of them uh, is important, but also the individual partnership and the individual partnership with the uh, uh, Republic of Korea, uh, with Japan and so on, they have value in themselves. And of course, we do different things with the different partners. Uh, but uh, uh, th there are some areas where I think obviously we can work together, um, uh, like cyber, uh, like uh, uh, like technology, like uh, arms control, but also I think on maritime issues there are there is a potential. But I think the most important thing is that just the fact that countries that believe in democracy, in the rule of law, in the rules-based international order, it is extremely important that we stand together. And, and when we see that authoritarian regimes are coming closer, working closer together in the political, in the diplomatic uh, domain, but also in the military domain, it is even more important that we stand together as countries believing in rules-based international order. Uh, so the political dimension, <coughs> on top of the practical cooperation, I think is of great importance. Then, of course, uh, uh, we have the cooperation between NATO as the institution and uh, the Republic of Korea and the other Asia or Indo-Pacific partners. But then, of course, individual partners, uh, not least the United States, also have <coughs> their bilateral uh, uh, cooperation in many areas, <coughs> including the military presence here. Uh, and, of course, uh, then the NATO um, uh, uh, cooperation adds to that and or provides a more uh, multinational framework to also the different bilateral uh, uh, engagements we have between NATO allies and, uh, and the Republic of Korea. So not not just security and political alliance, but also the value alliance to absolutely. Yeah, yeah. This is about security, but but security is also about values because it's about protecting those values. And we see that authoritarian powers are now more on the offensive than we have seen for many years, and they are standing close together. And therefore, it's even more important that we believe in democracy, freedom, stand together. I actually have one uh, interesting question, but very crucial question from the high school student. <laughs> there is a high school st student also uh, in today's session. What will be the future of NATO after the Ukrainian war? To which direction NATO will evolve in the future? So what we are talking about at some point in the future. So I'm a bit careful uh, answering that question because the success of NATO is that we have always been able to change as the world is changing. Uh, so uh, the most important thing is to continue to be adaptable, to continue to change when we see new challenges and new uh, crises. Uh, so my main answer is in a way that uh, the best thing NATO can do is to realize that uh, that uh, to continue to be the strongest and most successful alliance in history, uh, we need to uh, uh, make sure that we are able to achieve two things. Maintain our unity. NATO, we are 30 allies, soon to become 32 allies with Finland and Sweden. 
uh, uh, we are different, of course, there are different views on some things. We, we do not always agree, but we're always able to uh, unite around our core tasks to protect and defend each other. So after the Ukrainian war, if uh, the, f the number one thing we need to deliver is to deliver continued unity across the lines. The other thing we need to continue to deliver is uh, that we uh, are adapting. Uh, I say that because for 40 years, NATO did one thing, and that was to deter the Soviet Union. Uh, then, the, then the Cold War ended, the Berlin Wall came down, and people actually asked whether we needed NATO. Because since NATO had one purpose, and that was to deter the Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact, and then suddenly the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union didn't exist anymore, then, then questions were asked whether we needed uh, uh, NATO. And, 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 and the saying was that either NATO has to uh, go out of area, also meaning go out of NATO territory, or out of business. And what we did was to go out of area, meaning we helped to end the ethnic wars in the Balkans. And that was the first time ever NATO also engaged in anything beyond NATO territory. Um, um, so that's my general uh, answer. If I should be a bit more specific, I, I think that, I think that, um, of course, what we see now is is uh, more uh, uh, big power competition. Uh, we see that uh, China is becoming more important for also our security. Um, uh, we see that technology becomes more and more important for our security. Um, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, autonomous uh, weapon systems, uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, applied or um, uh, also used uh, in military systems, of course, uh, uh, opens up totally new challenges when it comes to what kind of threats uh, we are faced with in the future. So therefore, to maintain our technological edge, uh, to to be on the forefront when it comes to the technology has always been important, but if anything, I think it becomes even more important now with uh, all the new disruptive technologies we see also uh, uh, used in the military domain. Excellent. So, well, NATO will evolve with with with, with not just security situation, but the technologies and, and new forms of international affairs. All right. So. Uh, I still have a few more questions, but I uh, would like to open the floor for more questions. Please raise your hand and please identify yourself when you make a question. And I kindly ask you to make one question at a time and please be brief. Now, the floor is open. Okay. Uh, why don't I? Go to the lady with, with white color. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Sui Ha, and I'm a PhD student at Korea University. I would like to say thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. And my question is about the possibility of adopting NATO's nuclear sharing program in South Korea and Northeast Asia. As missile and nuclear threat from North Korea became more visible, many South Koreans began to argue for a more institutionalized nuclear deterrence framework in these regions. For deployed the U.S. nuclear capability in South Korea can strengthen the credibility of U.S. extended deterrence. So I would like to ask your opinions about the optimal nuclear deterrence program in Northeast Asia, especially in South Korea. Thank you. Well, first of all, I think it's important to understand that uh, what we call uh, extended deterrence, um, uh, meaning that, that NATO allies, but also some NATO partners, uh, like, uh, for instance, uh, uh, South Korea, uh, or, uh, they don't have their own nuclear weapons, but they're covered by uh, the nuclear deterrence that, uh, uh, that uh, the United States uh, provides. <clears throat> that is a way to prevent uh, proliferation of nuclear weapons, and it's uh, absolutely also in line with the non-proliferation uh, uh, treaty. I say that because um, our nuclear sharing arrangements that we have in NATO is a way to institutionalize uh, the, uh, the extended nuclear deterrence that uh, the United States uh, provides. Um, let me also start by, by saying that NATO's goal is a world without nuclear weapons. 
uh, because we actually believe that if it's possible to reach uh, uh, a, a status where uh, we have a world without nuclear weapons, that will be a safer world than a, a world with nuclear weapons. At the same time, and that is extremely important, as long as nuclear weapons exist, uh, NATO will remain a nuclear alliance. Uh, meaning that uh, we don't believe that a world where NATO and NATO allies, the United States, the United Kingdom and France, that are the three NATO allies with nuclear weapons, that if we get rid of our nuclear weapons and countries like uh, uh, Russia, uh, China and North Korea um, uh, keep theirs, uh, that will not be a safer world, that will be a more dangerous world. So, uh, so we uh, think that uh, as long as nuclear weapons exist, and especially as long as we see that authoritarian powers uh, are, uh, are having them and actually investing heavily in modernizing them, as we see uh, not least China is doing and, and, and increasing the number of nuclear weapons and the range, and also what we see the North Korea, North Korea is doing, uh, then, then uh, nuclear deterrence still has a, an extremely important uh, uh, task to fulfill. Exactly how that extended nuclear deterrence is was this, uh, organized between the United States and the Republic of Korea, I'll be careful to give any advice. I think that's in a way a bilateral issue between, uh, between uh, the Republic of Korea and the United States. What I can say is that the way we have done it in Europe is that there are also uh, American nuclear uh, devices or bombs uh, uh, which are then uh, uh, where we have European allies providing the platforms, the capabilities, the planes uh, uh, to deliver them uh, and, uh, and where we have uh, agreed uh, doctrines uh, um, and, uh, and, uh, and tested also, and also doc doctrines and, 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 and way to, uh, to, to deliver these deterrents together as, as, as a shared thing but where the nuclear weapons are owned by the United States but some of the delivery systems and so on are delivered by all, all the NATO allies. And that is a way that has worked well uh, in Europe for decades and is in full compliance with the NPT Treaty. All right, so, and the second question. Uh, may I uh, go for this side and uh, maybe uh, the lady here the se on the second floor. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for the great speech for your uh, for this e uh, this morning. And uh, I'm from Korea National Diplomatic Academy. Actually, I'm teaching on the European security and the foreign relations to future diplomats. Uh, you and then also I have worked on the NATO's uh, strategic uh, concept, uh, the previous one and the last one as well, uh, uh, last year's one as well. Uh, you answered my possible questions on a lot of policies of NATO's. I will go for a little bit personal level. Uh, your family, I understand, has served your country. Uh, not just you, but many of your family members have served your country and the world peace in many ways, and I really respect that. And I think all these young people behind me also would respect uh, and appreciate that efforts. The reason I think these young people are behind us, uh, listening carefully for your uh, ideas, is want to also learn from your experiences and uh, how what it means for serve the country and the sub world peace in different situations, as you mentioned, the different allies in sometimes many disputes. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, I uh, was <laughs> say about that. You know, for me, it has just fallen, and also for my family members. My father was uh, uh, foreign minister and defense minister for many years, and then my mother was uh, State Secretary, uh, uh, working with uh, yeah, both family policies, but also industrial policies uh, in Norway for many years. And then uh, uh, my wife is a diplomat. Uh, so I think when you refer to my family, I think uh, that's what you're referring to. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I can only speak for myself, and that is that um, for me, it has just fallen very natural to, uh, to, 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 to serve. Uh, uh, in, in the Norwegian government for many years, and then later on uh, for the UN and, and now for uh, NATO. 
Uh, it has been a great privilege. It has uh, given me the opportunity to work with extremely meaningful things. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm not a professional diplomat. I'm a politician. So I, I joined a, a political party in Norway, and I was elected to the parliament, and I uh, spent uh, oh, my whole life until I was uh, the end, uh, end of my 50s uh, in Norwegian politics. Uh, 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 but that's also a way to serve, uh, and we need politicians uh, in democracies. There is no way we can have uh, driving and strong democracy without people being engaged. Uh, and I, and I strongly believe that to be engaged in uh, in 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 political work, uh, either in political parties or in political organizations, uh, first of all, that's extremely important because that's part of the social fabric uh, democratic countries need. Uh, and uh, and second, it's a very good school. Also, I have learned uh, enormously uh, also a lot from my political work, uh, and then I've also had the, the privilege of uh, working with uh, uh, great people and uh, and uh, and having meaningful tasks uh, as as a politician and now as a Secretary General of NATO. So I don't know what more advice I can give you. Um, uh, it's always um, uh, good to study. That's. Uh, that's a good advice, um, and to try to finish what you study, because I mean, you, yeah, it's not always so easy to finish, but um, but um, yeah, that's my best advice. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, the value of conversation is actually we can have a lot of frank uh, discussion, but uh, very regrettably we have a limited uh, time. We are close. Well, heading toward. The, uh, the deadline, so uh, I have to uh, wrap up the Q&A session here. And so sorry for uh, the audience still ha have a lot of inquiries, but we will find another way to, to fill up that inquiries. And uh, last but, but not least, uh, a Korean diplomat. Uh, on behalf of the Republic of Korea, uh, Ambassador Yoon Sun Gu, in uh, the, the Korean ambassador to Belgium, European Union, and, and NATO, kindly accompanied the Secretary General's visit. So, uh, please give a, a warm round of applause to uh, Ambassador Yoon Sun Gu. <laughs> we do appreciate your effort and, uh, and contribution to enhance our mutual partnership. So, and once again, I appreciate Secretary General Stoltenberg's kind answers, your insight and encouragement for our future partnership. And we will surely build a strong alliance to cope with the global crisis. So ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm round of applause to Secretary General Stoltenberg. And I also thank the leadership and the staffs at Che Institute and John Money Center at Korea University for organizing this wonderful event. And lastly, I thank the audience for great question and warm attention. So thank you very much. <laughs>